Would you read with me? Then I heard what sounded like a great multitude, like the roar of rushing waters and like loud peals of thunder, shouting, Hallelujah, for the Lord God Almighty reigns. Let us rejoice and be glad and give him glory. For the wedding of the Lamb has come, and his bride has made herself ready. Join with us. He's coming on the clouds. Kings and kingdoms will bow down. Every chain and every chain will break. And broken hearts declare his praise. For who can stop the Lord Almighty? So here's our theme this morning. Open up the gates. Make way for the King of Kings. So open up the gates. Make way before the King of Kings. The God who comes to save is here to set the captives free. For who can stop the Lord Almighty? And before we pray, I meant to say this during the welcome. I want to th- uh, thank everyone who, uh, all of our volunteers that helped out this, this Friday uh, with our lock-in. Uh, if they start dozing off, give them some grace. If I start dozing off, give me some grace as well. Uh, but we had a good time. We enjoyed our time all night. And then we woke up Saturday morning and we put kids to work. Um, and we had a cleaning day up on the youth floor and we... We went to town, let me tell you. We found some stuff that was probably up there right after that uh, This building, that building was built. Uh, and probably even older, some of the stuff. But we, we, we got a chance to clean it up, wipe everything down. Uh, so we appreciate any of the help from all the folks that, that helped, came with or not, and the, those that prayed for us, even if you were sleeping and praying at the same time. We appreciate that. Well, let's go to the Lord in, in prayer as we continue to worship together. Heavenly Father, we just do thank you for this day. God, we do thank you for the opportunity, Lord, to come into your house and to, to worship, God, Lord, to take an hour out of our week to, to focus on you, focus on what you've done in our lives, focus on what you're doing in our lives and through our lives, Lord. Lord, thank you for those that are in this sanctuary today. Lord, be with those that aren't with us, whether they're out sick or traveling, Lord, or just needed a few uh, extra hours of sleep, God. Let them feel your presence as we feel your presence here. Be with Chuck as he brings your word, God. Fill him with your spirit as he uh, preaches on your truth, Lord. We are so thankful for for him and Connie and their time here at First Baptist. Lord, I pray that they they know that and feel that. Lord, again, just uh, be with us and let us forget about what's happened this week so that we can focus on you. We just love you and praise you in Jesus' name. Amen. You may be seated.
Give me a hand. The reason we're here this morning, why we were created, is simply to praise Him. Garrett, lead us off. him in the evening. Join us and let Kay leads us as we continue to worship. Is a strong and mighty tower, your name 
each and every day just how much he loves you and me.
sing your name we speak your name the power and the comfort that is in that name is beyond our comprehension as humans to really grasp but we thank you for the power and the strength that you give us within that name the strength and the power to live every single day as your child today father I pray that you would give us the recognition to hear your voice as you speak through brother Chuck Change our lives today is our prayer. We don't want to walk out of here the same, but we want to be more and more like you every day. So we pray for Chuck. We thank you for the time that he has spent here teaching us. Continue to open our ears and our eyes, and may our hearts be obedient to what you teach us. And we ask that in your name. And all God's people said, amen. Chuck. Thank you, Bill. Thank you for the praise team. Amanda. Absolutely wonderful. Where'd you go? There she is. There she is. Absolutely great. Uh, earlier this week, I watched uh, the service uh, from last week, and I'm celebrating with you today. Pastor, we're so glad you're here. What a great opportunity for someone who is among us to come and be uh, the leader of us. So thank you so much. Uh, I re appreciate it. Connie and I watched the service again this morning. You were so good. I wanted to see it again. <laughs> oh, man. Some of you may know that I like movies. Just in case you didn't know, I like movies. I uh, pick out lines every once in a while that uh, kind of help me to find meaning in life. So I'm going to quote a couple today. From Poltergeist, my wife and I, they're back. <laughs> uh, from Arnold Schwarzenegger, <laughs> for next Sunday, I'll be back. So I'm, I'm so looking forward to today and next week. This has been an absolutely wonderful opportunity for Connie and me. Some of you have said very kind words, and we're grateful for the kind words, but um, really the blessing has been ours. We're, we've really enjoyed uh, being a part of this church for these six months. So congratulations to Vince, and uh, we'll pray for him and, and Mary Helen as they uh, lead us. And I pray that you will... Uh, be aware of their needs 
we need to all pray for them as they begin their ministry as pastor here. I've had uh, some people come to me and say, you know, I just don't know what God's will is for my life. But whatever it is, I'm going to do it. Perhaps some of you find yourself in that position today. You are willing to do God's will, but you just don't know what it is that you're supposed to do. My suspicion, however, is that most of us are on the other side of that coin. We know what God's will is for our lives, but we just don't want to carry it out. Too hard, too much discipline, too much time. Just don't want to do it. Today I want to address both sides of the issue because this is one of those hard issues of the faith that you and I need to know about. So today we're going to talk about knowing and doing God's will. To those who are willing but don't know what it is, I'm going to tell you what it is. Y'all didn't know you had such uh, power in the pulpit today. Just kidding. But I am going to tell you what God's will for your life is because the Bible is very clear about what God's will for our lives is. To those who know deep down in your heart what God's will is, but you are unwilling to follow through, I'm going to challenge you to actually let go and do it. Some of us just need to let go and allow God to live his life out through us so that we can be and do the things that he has asked of us. Right before I went to uh, Lifeway Christian Resources, at the time it was called the Baptist Sunday School Board, the actual title was the, Southern, uh, the Sunday School Board of the Southern Baptist Convention, but that was way too much, so we just call it the BSSB. I went to a writer's conference right after I went to uh, Lifeway, and uh, I had written some things for them, but I didn't really know all the details and, uh, and uh, logistics and the format for everything that needed to be done. So I went to this writer's conference with people who were getting ready to write Bible study material for... Uh, I think it was like a year later. Um, that's one of the things about writing for a, a company like Lifeway or Baptist Way Press, which is what we use. Uh, it's, it's out there. So when people come up and say, man, I enjoyed your lesson, I'm saying, what lesson? It was a lesson that was written a year before today. So um, right before I went there, I, I went to this conference, and here's what they told us. Every time you do a Bible study or you do a sermon, you need to have two teaching aims. Two teaching aims. The first one is a knowledge aim. This is to acquaint the learner with the information he or she may not have known before. But the danger of this aim by itself is that we get a lot of information but no life transformation. You and I are really good at listening to information, and we as teachers sometimes are really good at giving the information, but the life change comes by doing something about it. So a knowledge aim. That's an important aim, uh, even as I preach today, an important aim. The second one, though, is have an action aim. Have an action aim. The idea here is to get the learners to put into practice what they may already know or maybe they've just learned. Now, that doesn't happen overnight. I know that. Uh, sometimes we uh, describe a Sunday school hour or a Bible study hour, even a sermon, uh, that we're getting all this information and at the end we pray a prayer like this, Dear God, help me to apply what I learned today. I'm in. Likely, the application doesn't really take place during that time. It takes place in the nitty-gritty of life, day in, day out, week in, week out, of seeking to live our lives uh, the way God has taught us through our teachers or preachers. And, and we've gotten the knowledge aim, but we also have the action aim. We're ready to do something about that. So those this morning are my two aims. I want to give some knowledge. Most of you probably know everything I'm going to say. But I'm also going to seek to get you to put it into practice. I think we need to know God's will, but I also think we need to do God's will. 
My text this morning is Romans chapter 12, 1 to 8. Very familiar passage for those of you who may go over to uh, the Baptist Memorial Center on Sunday evenings. I, I used this text and a little bit of this outline when I spoke about three or four weeks ago about this. But Romans 12, chapter 8. For the first category of us who don't know what God's will is for our lives, I have some good news and some not so good news. The good news is, I can tell you what God's will for your life is. I can tell you. I'm not anything special. It's in Scripture. I can tell you. The not so good news is, I can't give you every single minute detail of what it takes to carry out that will. I'll leave that part to you and God's Holy Spirit so that you can begin to be and do exactly what God wants you to be and do. So look with me at Romans chapter 12, and I'm going to begin reading in the NIV version, beginning with verse 1, chapter 12. Therefore I urge you, brothers, in view of God's mercies, to offer your bodies as living sacrifices, holy and pleasing to God. This is your spiritual act of worship. Do not conform any longer to the pattern of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Then you will be able to test and approve what God's will is, His good, pleasing, and perfect will. For by the grace given me, I say to every one of you, do not think of yourself more highly than you ought, but think of yourself with sober judgment in accordance with the measure of faith God has given you. Just as each of us has one body with mem many members, and these members do not have all the same function, so in Christ we who are many form one body, and each member belongs to all the others. We have different gifts according to the grace given us. If a man's gift is prophesying, let him use it in proportion to his faith. If it is teaching, let him teach. If it is encouraging, let him encourage. If it is contributing to the needs of others, let him give generously. If it is leadership, let him govern diligently. If it is showing mercy, let him do it cheerfully. Now what I want you to do is to note that phrase in the first couple of verses there, that you may test and approve what God's will is, his good, pleasing and perfect will. So God's Word, the Bible, is going to help us have an understanding of what His will is for our lives, and He's also going to help us have an understanding about how we can put it into practice. Now, I want to call your attention to several passages of Scripture, most of which you, are, you, you know. You've heard them before. Uh, that You're very familiar with them. Micah 6, 8 he has told you, O oh man, what is good, and what does the Lord require of you but to do justice and to love mercy and to walk humbly with your God. Romans 8, 28, 29, you've heard me quote that, those two verses many times in my time here. And we know that in all things, all things, all things, God works for the good of those who love Him and are called according to His purpose. For those God foreknew, He also predestined to be conformed to the image of His Son. Ephesians chapter 1, verse 4 to 6, For He chose us in Him before the creation of the world to be holy and blameless in His sight. In love, He predestined us to be adopted as His Son, as his sons through Jesus Christ in accordance with his pleasure and will. Ephesians 5, 17 and 18, Therefore do not be foolish, but understand what the Lord's will is. Do not get drunk on wine, which leads to debauchery. Instead, be filled with the Spirit. 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, verses 3 and 4, and then verse 7 it is God's will that you should be sanctified or that you should be set apart, that you should be holy, that you should avoid sexual immorality, that each of you should control his own body in a way that is holy and honorable. And then verse 7, For God did not call us to be impure, but to live 
a holy life, a separate life, a, a life set aside for his purpose. 1 Peter 2.15, For it is God's will that by doing good you should silence the ignorant talk of foolish men. Get an idea about God's will in those passages? The truth is, God's will for our lives is that we be like His Son. If you're looking for purpose in life, here it is. Like His Son. We're to have the characteristics, the character of Jesus Christ Himself. Now, <laughs> I've said this before, you can't wake up in the morning, tomorrow morning, and say, oh, what, today I'm going to be like Jesus. That's not possible. We in our human nature cannot be just like Jesus. But Jesus can be just like himself as he lives his life out through us. So we, God's will is that we be like his son. We don't have to do this on our own. We just have to be participants. And then Jesus will live his life as he wants to live it out through, it, through our lives. Here's how you can know and do some of the nitty-gritty parts of knowing God's will. Some keys are found in this passage. Again, nothing is new to you. You've heard this passage preached before. We were visiting with uh, Sherman and Ellen Clark and, and Charlie and Judy Smith last night. And they were telling us who had preached from this pulpit I was a little intimidated, a little intimidated. Some of my favorite preachers, Dr. Paul Powell and, and Dr. Joel Gregory, are people who have preached from this pulpit. I am sure that you have heard these things before. Now let them kind of roll around in your mind and settle there and begin to live the life to which he has called you. Here's a key. It's not even in the list of keys that I'm going to give you, but here it is. Unless we do God's will, we have not learned God's will. Unless we do it, we've not learned it. As I told you before, my friend used to say, the final step in learning is application. So unless we do it, once we know it, unless we do it, we haven't learned it. So here is how we can perform God's will in our lives, straight out of Scripture, straight out of this passage. The first key is this, give yourself to God. Give yourself to God. Romans chapter 12, verse 1, Therefore I urge you, brothers, in view of God's mercy, to Offer your bodies or give yourself to God as living sacrifices, holy and pleasing to God. And this is your spiritual act of worship. It's an act of our will to give ourselves to God. We don't just kind of sit around and it kind of falls on us. We have to give ourselves to God. We have to offer ourselves to God as a living sacrifice. It is an act of will that's based on all that we know of God. Some of you are like me. When I was six years old, I became a believer. <clears throat> I gave as much of myself as I understood to as much of God as I understood. And I didn't understand very much about either. But you and I must, on a continual basis, give ourselves to God. In fact, in this verse, it says, offer yourselves to God. The real translation of that is, keep on offering yourselves to God. Note the word, therefore. 
and I'm sure you've heard this before. I've heard it dozens of times myself. Therefore, refers back to all that God has made available to us as Christians. In Romans chapters 1 through 11 is the background for these verses. Paul's pattern of writing, if you read through his, his uh, various letters, the first part of each letter is the theological part of what he's trying to tell the people to whom he is writing. And then there is a therefore or wherewith or some kind of word like that, then, then there is this application. That's Paul's pattern. If you write, if you, again, if you read the books, you're going to find that. What Paul does here is that he reiterates that by saying, in view of God's mercy. In view of God's mercy. You and I don't deserve a relationship with him, but Paul lays out all this theology that gives us an opportunity to have a relationship with him. Therefore, keep on giving yourselves to God. Here's the point. I must give by an act of my will all that I know of myself to all that I know of God. God wants all of us. He doesn't want just part of us. You've heard this phrase, if he's not Lord of all, he is not Lord at all. Now, I call your attention to something I discovered a, a while back. Those of you who are medical doctors, you'll understand this. Have you ever heard of the all or none law? It's the all or none law. It's, it's about the, your nerves and your muscles. Let me read the definition, then I'll explain it to you. It says this, The principle that under given conditions, the response of a nerve or muscle fiber to a stimulus at any strength above the threshold is the same. The muscle or nerve responds completely or not at all. So if you start exercising your muscle, if you start to pick up something, that it will, it will completely go through with the action or it won't do anything at all. If the nerve uh, stimulates you to do something and you don't do it, then the nerve doesn't work. It's the all or none law. That's what Jesus has asked of us, the all or none law. Either give yourself to me and keep giving yourself to me, or don't give yourself to me. Revelation says, says it like this, <laughs> I wish you were hot or cold, but because you're neither hot nor cold, I'm going to spit you out of my mouth. Keep on giving yourself to God in an all or none way. Galatians 2.20 says, I've been crucified with Christ, and I no longer live, but Christ lives in me. The life I live in the body, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. So the first key, if you want to know and do God's will, is to give yourself to God and keep on giving yourself to God. The second key is do not conform to the world's standards, found in verse 2. Uh, it says this, do not conform any longer to the pattern of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Don't conform. Philip's translation, and I'm sure you've heard this before. I know I've heard it several times, and I've said it several times. It translates that part of the verse like this. Don't let the world squeeze you into its mold. You and I are different because we have a relationship with Jesus Christ, we are different than everyone else, or at least we ought to be. So we're going to keep on giving ourselves to God, but we're not going to allow the world to squeeze us into its mold. We're not going to conform any longer to the pattern of this world. Each of us is a unique person. You shouldn't let that uniqueness get lost in our trying to be like everyone else. We are called to be like Jesus. Being holy doesn't mean looking like everyone else. It means being separate. A strong statement. It's strong to you, but it's also strong to me. It is impossible to be like Christ and like the world at the same time. Can't do it. Don't let the world squeeze you into its mold. Third key is this. 
Let God transform you. Let God transform you. Again, in verse 2, at the end of the verse, uh, then you will be able to test it, uh, let's see, be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Then you will be able to test and approve what God's will is, His good, pleasing, and perfect will. The word for transform in English is metamorphosis. Familiar word for those of you who are taking science. Metamorphosis. The Greek word is metamorphosi. Really close. The word means transform, change, made different. All of you have heard the illustration about the caterpillar who wraps himself up in uh, the, the silky cord and then he burst out a few weeks later and he is a butterfly. He has been transformed. He has been completely changed. Let God transform you. Completely changed. Now most of you are probably like me. I, I have good intentions about that. I want to be transformed. I want to be like Jesus. So I'll give myself to God and I'll try not to let the world squeeze me in it, into its uh, mold. And then I'll start the process. And I'm, I'm sure I'd be a terrible looking butterfly because I start the process and then I back up. I stop the, start the process and back up. Start the process back up. What Paul is saying is here, let God transform you completely. 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 20, uh, verse 17. For all things are made new. You're, you're not the old way. You, you are not the old person. You've, been, you've begun to become new. Let God transform you. The good news for every single person in this room is a believer who makes mistakes and they fall back and then they start again, they fall back, is that God works in a process. I say to people all the time, the only thing instant about Christianity is when I invite Jesus Christ to come into my life and save me, He does. That's the only thing that's instant. Everything else is a process. Everything else is, I'm in the process of becoming like Jesus Christ. I don't automatically do everything I'm supposed to do overnight. It takes the gradual turning of my life over to his lordship, the gradual saying, okay, God, I surrender to what you want me to do and be. I surrender. I surrender. I keep on surrendering. It is a long, hard process. We let him take control of our lives, and he gradually makes us into people who look and act and have the same attitude as Jesus Christ. God wants to renew your mind. He wants to. Jesus said, and, and by the way, he added to the Old Testament law, the Shema, which is found in Deuteronomy chapter 6, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, and strength. When Jesus was asked what the greatest commandment was in Mark, he said, Hear, O Israel, the Lord your God is one God. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind, and with all your strength. God is in the process of renewing our minds. Here's some ways. None of this is magic. It takes discipline. You can do it. Memorize Scripture. Memorize Scripture. Now, the older you get, I testify, the older you get, the harder it is to remember what you memorized. Seriously, every morning I, I, I have a little... Uh, process I go through when I get to my office. I have a stack of cards, uh, of scripture memory cards that I used to know. So what I'm doing is I'm reviewing all the time. I, I'm not a big fan of Bill Gothard. He may be your best friend or your brother, but I'm not a big fan of Bill Gothard. But one thing I did like about him was he said, memorize scripture. Memorize Scripture, and here's what will happen. As you memorize Scripture and you repeat it over and over, it flows through your mind. It cleans out the dross. It makes you into a different person. Memorize Scripture. I, I used to hear youth ministers say all the time, you need to memorize a passage of Scripture a week. Okay, that's a great challenge at camp. Start memorizing Scripture. About the third week, my mind is on overload. 
You, could, you carry that out like 52 weeks or maybe 10 years, like 520 weeks, pretty soon your mind just doesn't get it. But if you constantly review it and let it roll through your mind, it cleans you up. It makes you into the person who looks like Jesus. Memorize scripture. Number two, feed your mind with healthy things. Now, don't hear me say I'm against movies or television or computer or any. I'm not. I mean, I use my computer every day. I watch TV most every night. I go to the movies. I enjoy getting things from the movies that I think God is telling me. But here's the thing. When you put trash in your mind, trash comes out of your mind. But if you put good things in your mind, good things will come out of your mind. Trying to make sense? Number three, listen to the Spirit's inner witness. If you are a believer in Christ, you have God's Spirit living within you. He's telling you, He's guiding you and me into what we ought to be doing and thinking and feeling and acting on in our lives. Listen to the Spirit's inner witnesses. He wants to guide you. Number four is act on what you know is right. I'm sitting around waiting for something to happen to me. Okay, now I'm doing God's will. No, act on what you know is right. You need to read Scripture. You already know that. You need to pray. You need to be faithful to the church. You need to share your life with others. Those are things that we can do. We can do those things. As you do them, you will not only be allowing God to transform you, you will also be doing the practical, everyday detail, the details of God's will. The fourth key is this. Have a correct evaluation of yourself. Verse 3 says, By the grace given me, I say to every one of you, do not think of yourself more highly than you ought, but think of yourself with sober judgment in accordance with the measure of God's grace. Doing God's will requires that you and I not think too highly of ourselves. We are just members of the team. We are members of the family. At the same time, we're not to think too lowly of ourselves. We are members of the team. We are members of the family. We belong. This verse, in my opinion, is the key verse to these eight verses. It's critical. I call it a swing verse. Verses 1 and 2 talk about our personally doing God's will for our individual Christian lives. Verses 4 to 8 talk about our doing God's will as it relates to the body of Christ, the church. If we don't have a correct evaluation of ourselves, if we think too highly of ourselves or we think too lowly of ourselves, we will not only not be able to do the things that relate to us personally, we will not be able to do the things that relate to the church, to the body of Christ. We won't be able to function properly. Have a correct evaluation of yourself. Last key. Use the gifts God has given to you for the benefit of your church. Use the gifts God has given to you for the benefit of your church. Just read those verses there, uh, verses uh, 4 through 8, and you're going to discover some things that you, you have. You have been given that gift. I believe I've been given the gift of teaching, but I tell my students all the time, God did not give me the gift of teaching to teach this college class. I get to use it in teaching that college class, but God gave me whatever gifts I have. He gave you whatever gifts you have for the benefit of the church. The church needs you. When I was in Conroe, we had a theme and I, we printed it on everything. We need you. And I was accused of all kinds of things related to that. But one of them was, well, you just want more people here. Well, yes, I do want more people here. But that's not why we have that theme. We have that theme because we need you to function as, with your member, I mean, with your gift for the members of the body. We need everyone. Without you, we are incomplete. We cannot function at the level God intends for us to function if we don't all get in there 
and do it. <coughs> we are not complete without all of us doing our part. So where are you today? Is it knowing God's will that you don't, that you don't understand? Or is it doing God's will? Both are important. Both are important. I offer this invitation. Actually, it's not me who's offering it. It's Christ who's offering it. Maybe you have never trusted Christ as personal Lord and Savior. That would be a beginning step to knowing and doing God's will. Maybe you're looking for a church home. This is a good one. I promise you, it's a good one. I've had the experience of six months being associated with this church. And, and by the way, it's been a phenomenal experience. Come join our church. Maybe you'd like to just say, okay, look, I've gotten off track and I'm not doing what I'm supposed to do, but I want to get back on track. I want to do God's will in my life. And, and Vince and I will be here to receive you. You can pray. We can pray with you and help you to get back on track. Maybe you just want to ask questions. I'll be here if you want to ask questions. Uh, Vince will be here. and You can ask him all the hard questions. Um, he's the pastor. So. <laughs> I've said this many times. I'm going to say it again, and I, I may say it next week, but I, I try to say it all the time. God is calling people to do his work. He's calling people to do his work. If there's this little niggling thing in your mind that God may be calling you to be a full-time vocational minister or a part-time vocational minister or to do something in the professional ministry, if that niggling is there, he wants you to respond. He is calling people. I offer that invitation. He's calling. We must respond. As I said, Vince and I will be here. We're happy to talk with you about anything. You come as God leads you to come. If you want to sit right there in your seat and pray, or maybe you want to make the decision, a commitment to uh, Christ where you're sitting, that is fine. That is great. You may want to turn to your person next to you and say, this is a decision I made today. Because when you tell about it, it gets solidified in us. Let's pray. Lord, even as uh, our team comes to lead us in this, what we call invitation, I pray that your spirit will fall on this place, that there'll be a sense of freedom that people could respond as they want to and as you're calling them to. We know this invitation is not about us. We know it's not about this sermon, about this worship service, even about the music. It is about you calling us to do something about the will that you have for our lives of becoming like Jesus. Help us to be brave. Help us to have courage to make decisions that need to be made to advance your kingdom's work through this church. And I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.